Hello, Econ 4312. In the previous videos, we talked a little bit about interest rates and present value. Uh, so we want to move away from the financial world and go back into the economics world and talk about quantity uh, supply and quantity demand for bond markets and shifts in demand. I'm going to be pulling my bond pricing material from the Money and Banking Open Access textbook that I've linked on Blackboard. So feel free to go to that. It is a 500-page document, so please just skip to Chapter 4. Uh, I'm looking at around page 94 of, of that book. It has a nice table, a nice setup to explain things. So if you don't catch everything I, I go through in this uh, video, then feel free to go back to this textbook and take a look. They do a great job of it. So. What I want to focus on is mainly interest rates behavior, specifically as it relates to something called the term structure. Now, this is going to be – we're going to get into the weeds a bit in terms of the economics. So in order to motivate you on this, what I want you guys to think about is what we're building to is the bond market is a great place to predict inflation, disinflation, and recession. So we are going to build up a measure that is going to – give us a check engine light for the economy. When this measure begins to go negative, then you know that maybe um, maybe something's going to happen, maybe not. But in terms of the engine of the economy, the warning light just went off. We're not sure what's going on, but we know something is going on. The other metaphor I use for this, uh, since we live out in the Texas panhandle anyway, uh, is when you know there's been a dry summer or a dry winter, so there is a danger of those grass fires, right? So there are the conditions for a financial crisis that may or may not happen depending on if, I don't know, someone flicks a cigarette out the driver's side window uh, or a campfire gets out of control. But the yield spread indicator is going to give us a way to see – if the tinder in the economy is dry enough to catch fire. So we're going to talk about bond markets. So let me find my uh, proper – there we go, right from the beginning. We're going to lecture now on interest rate behavior, term structure, and risk. So remember with a bond market um, – these bonds provide store of value and speculation. So they're not really money, but they – provide substitute and complementary services to that store of value and specula speculative service that money provides. Remember, money has four services, medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value. Hold on one second. Yes, that red dot is going. I did hit record. And these assets provide a service. And that service can be modeled in a perfectly competitive market, a monopolistic market, a monopolistically competitive market, a monopsonistic market. We're going to look at the perfectly competitive view of the bond market because that's the one you're all used to from uh, your microeconomics courses, right? So bonds are priced like money, like cars, like uh, hamburgers and lobster and uh, – university tuition based on supply and demand. An asset demand is determined by a buyer's willingness and ability to purchase a bond, which means that we can shift that demand curve based on their wealth, expected returns, risk, and liquidity. Now, on the supply side, that is if the lender is more willing and able to provide this bond. So when is the U.S. government more willing and able to issue a bond? When is uh, Apple more willing and able to issue uh, commercial paper? Uh, when is uh, the, the French government more likely to issue a bond? What would be the factors that determine whether that supply or demand curve shifts out? And of course, in any Perfectly competitive economic equilibrium, we have the magical X, right? Supply and demand meet at the point of equilibrium. Quantity of bonds demanded equals quantity of bonds supplied, and the market is going to clear. So we're creating our model that's going to describe the price pressure of the bond market and that service they provide in store of value and speculation. So let's talk about the determinants that shift bond demand. Now, from the demand side, generally what shifts uh, bond demand and then, of course, prices is going to be relative wealth, 
expected interest rates in the future, expected inflation in the future, the relative risk of the within the economy, the relative liquidity in the economy, and that will be our demand shift. Our supply shift will be based on the expectation of inflation in the future, profitability within the economy, the ability of uh, corporations, companies, firms to gain profit from any issuance, and of course, then government deficit or surplus. Please excuse me. So if we have an increase in relative wealth throughout the economy, right, if we have a boom time, then our bond demand curve is going to shift out or shift right, right? That's an increase in demand. If we are expecting higher interest rates in the future, then bond demand is going to shift in or decrease. If we are expecting higher inflation in the future, then bond demand is going to shift in or decrease. Now, the intuition behind that expectation of inflation, and that's a key one. Notice I've got this highlighted in red. If we see higher inflation later on in the economy, we are going to demand those bonds that lock us into low rates of return less. So imagine this. Uh, bonds interest rates are prevailing at, say, 4%, but we expect 8% inflation in the future. You don't want to lock in for 10, 30 years, uh, for 10 or 30 years, a 4% return when you know that it's going to be eaten by inflation, right? So remember, expectations are changes in the present that rely on what we think is going to happen in the future. So that's kind of the tricky one, and I got into a bit of trouble with this uh, in my lectures late last week in my in-class version because I actually went backwards on this because I was up in front of students and wasn't quite thinking, ah, so I'm going to have to go back and change that and correct myself on it. And mainly because I was thinking, well, what are they going to do to change their uh, demand in the future? That That's the wrong way of thinking about this. We're looking at information in the future and changing our behavior in the present. So be careful with expectations. Uh, again, I like this open access book that I am uh, giving you uh, the link to. Uh, chapter four and chapter five deal with the bond markets. They explain it very well. Okay, relative risk in the economy. If it increase uh, increases, excuse me, bond demand decreases. Why you don't want to lock in your liquidity if you think you may lose your job in six months, right? You don't want to be locking in your wealth into ten or thirty year bonds that you can't access or can't access cheaply anyway. If you think you're going to need that money six months in advance, uh, if the liquidity available throughout the economy increases, if there's just more money floating around, uh, then bond demand goes up because, well, we've got a lot of liquidity here, so let's go ahead and lock that wealth in to try and get that return from the future. All right, so let's take a look at supply. Expectations of inflation go the opposite direction for suppliers, right? If they see in the future higher inflation, they want to lock in that lower interest rate now because their real return is going to be much uh, higher than due to the inflation, right? Okay. Uh, if let's see here, uh, profitability within the economy goes up. If corporations are more profitable, if the government is getting a whole lot more in tax revenue as well, uh, then they are more willing and able to supply bonds at that time. And of course, if there is a large government deficit, let's say there's a fiscal policy that decreased taxes uh, or increased spending or both at the same time, the government needs to make up for that shortfall in uh, revenue versus spending by taking out debt, by providing more bonds available on the market. So that's a good review of kind of how this works. Let's take a look at the pictures. Now, the importance of the bond market here is going to be that we can see what happens with that price on the market, but what we can also see is what happens with that interest rate. So here we have quantity on the horizontal axis. We have price on the vertical axis such that going from P1 to P0, right, is an increase in those prices, right? There's our equilibrium. As we go up this curve, that's an increase in prices. But for interest rates, as we go down, that's an increase in interest rates. 
price of the bond and the interest rate are going to move in opposite directions. So we want to keep that in mind because then if we have, say, a change in what was my example here. Uh, so this is going to be uh, the Build Back Better program, right, after uh, 2020, 2021, somewhere around there, right? The most recent fiscal policy that I can think of, the government is going to need to uh, spend more than it's receiving in taxes. And what's it going to what's that going to do? It's going to have an increase in the supply side, right? So that supply curve is shifting right or increasing. And that means the price of bonds is going down, but the interest rate is increasing. So that's the utility we get from uh, knowing what the determinants of shifting a supply or demand curve in the bond market are. Now, let's say then, uh, okay, so there's our interest rates, right? Now, let's say that the Federal Reserve is signaling to the markets. The Federal Reserve, and now in this case, we're doing this expectation of inflations issue, right? Although without a supply curve shift. I think I stuck to just a demand curve shift on this one. Um, we already have the supply curve shift of the government pushing out. If we have these higher inflation expectations, then that's going to affect the demand curve, decreasing the price of bonds. And what about the interest rates? Increasing the interest rates. Now, of course, this also depends on the Fed being credibly believed. Maybe they're signaling it and people's expectations don't shift. So you need to keep in mind this can get really messy, really fast. So you want to try and clarify your thought process. Take things one step at a time. That's what's so wonderful about microeconomics that you can do uh, and basically have a have a better time determining price and interest rates than, of course, you would in a macroeconomic model. So for the effect on bond rates for the Build Back Better program, supply of bonds increases, higher supply of that store of value and speculation service that bonds provide, lowers bond prices, raises bond rates. Now then, the Fed begins to signal that it's concerned about inflation. People's expectations on inflation go with it. They credibly believe what the Fed is reporting. There will be future inflation. Demand for bonds decreases. There's a higher uh, – excuse me, lower – lower – Demand on the store of value and speculation on that and lowering bond prices uh, and rising bond rates again. So uh, that's how this works. We can, of course, go back to say we can talk about what happened during COVID, what happened during the Great Recession, what happened during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. How does that affect our bond prices? And here – what we have is just several of these bond rates. I don't like to put multiple series on a graph. It tends to look ugly, but eh, since this provides some information, I'm going to go ahead and do this. What we have is the five-year bond, the seven-year bond, the 10-year bond, the 20-year bond, and the 30-year bond. And here we have, in this case, uh, 2019, 2020, the Fed is signaling that it thinks there's going to be uh, some inflationary pressures. Um, the bond market starts to react to that. We also um, can talk about some fiscal policies going on in this case. But then here we have post-COVID, right, where we suddenly have the bond rates increasing again. So what's going on there and what effects are happening to increase those bond rates along the menu of that maturity available? So let's take a look. And what we also need to remember when we talk about store of value and speculation, there is a liquidity preference. So according to li liquidity preference, the determination of interest in the bond market influences the determination of interest in the money market. So if I'm given a choice between $500 in bonds it, at zero interest rate and $500 in cash at zero interest rate, I will choose the cash because I prefer liquidity, right? Money is liquid, can be used in various situations. I can buy groceries with it. I can't buy groceries with a 10-year bond or a 30-year bond. So agents are going to have this two-stage budgeting approach where they determine how much they want to put into store of value and speculation of the bond market versus how much they want in liquidity of the money market. But this is constrained by wealth because you cannot have more money and savings than your wealth allows. So keep this in mind as bond rates begin to go towards zero. There could be some switching 
into money markets because they're beginning to look like the returns on money markets without the advantage of that liquidity. This goes back to our opportunity cost of holding money, right? This goes back to that benchmark asset minus the interest of the asset that we're holding normalized to the overall return. That gives us a price of the store of value service. Okay. So remember, the interest rate is not the price over time, the interest rate is the return. The price over time is what you are giving up in terms of that interest return in order to hold on to some kind of liquidity. So by theory of the coin, demand of money is inversely related to interest rates. So as users give up more and more holdings there, there's both a substitution and a complementarity effect. Remember what I mean by substitutes and complements. In some cases, money is a substitute for bonds. You think of store of value, right? Money market funds can earn an interest rate uh, that maybe is less than a bond, but it can still get that uh, store of value service. Or it could be that money is a complement, that medium of exchange and store of value services go together so you hold a certain amount of cash and a certain amount of bonds. This is reflected in the price, and the price needs to be correctly measured as that spread of interest rate. Okay. So again, uh, user cost, opportunity cost, good things to know. Now let's talk about what shifts money markets because we want to think about them uh, together, separate, but you know they move in different ways, and we need to figure that out. There is an income effect, right? Income goes up, M demand for money goes up because if you're wealthier, you want to buy more stuff. To buy more stuff, you have to hold more money. This doesn't change money supply. There's a relative price effect. If it becomes uh, relatively more expensive to hold bonds, then money demand is going to go up, right? That's that's that kind of substitutes issue, right? So that money demand goes up if the relative price of holding something other than money begins to increase, right? Okay. Did I say that correctly? Hmm. Yes, yes. If it becomes more expensive to hold other stuff than you want to hold uh, money. Federal Reserve stimulus does not affect money demand, but it does affect the money supply. Okay, So those are the three things that will shift the money supply or demand curve. We will generally follow with uh, the Federal Reserve orthodoxy of drawing the money supply curve as perfectly inelastic and money demand as inelastic. We'll go ahead and put our interest rate here instead of a price. That's fine because we tried – the Federal Reserve is going to try and target these short-term interest rates. If I really wanted a price here, I should be doing a spread, but okay. That's what we'll do, and that's also in the open access textbook, so we'll go with it. So let's suppose um, tech boom. Let's suppose people feel wealthier. Then that means money demand goes out. Interest rates start to rise right? because the Fed is not going to provide uh, any more increases in that money growth. They haven't made a policy yet to respond. Now, it could be that the Fed sees this and they want to keep those interest rates low, so the Fed may decide that they will expand the money supply, right? lower that interest rate, and that's how they would do it. They increase the growth to a faster uh, rate of money growth, and that interest rate then goes down. All right, so a monetary contraction, on the other hand, would have rising interest rates as the Fed contracts the money supply. Uh, we could also have uh, money demand fall as well. So in terms of money markets, what, what are these effects going to be? To increase interest rates, the Fed wants to slow down the rate of money growth. To decrease interest rates, they'll speed up the rate of money growth. Higher money demand will lead to higher interest. Lower money demand will lead to lower interest. And that is where I am going to stop this video for today. And we will get into the rest of these lectures and the yield spread in the next video when we start relating more and more of these bond markets and money markets. Where's stop recording?